It is common for a lot of organizations to throw in detections or attempt to make, for example, the MITRE ATT&CK matrix as green as possible, and then say they're done. We've done all the detections we need, we're good to go, and they're not actually reflecting and updating based on intelligence. They may find that some of their old detections are not necessary anymore, prone to false positives, where there's new techniques or new permutations of the same techniques that now need to be incorporated. Welcome to another episode of Mannion's Defenders Advantage podcast. I am your host, Luke McNamara. I am joined today by two members of our Mannion consulting team, Dan Nutting and Sean Nakwadi, to talk about the trend that has been emerging with some of the activity we have been responding to throughout last year. Not a new trend, but one that we are seeing more of in some cases, which is the trend of living off the land techniques. Uh, so we're going to dive into that topic today. Dan, Sean, great to have you here uh, with me. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Luke. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is not a new technique, um, but I think even you know for some of the folks listening, maybe they're less familiar with this. When we say living off the land, a living off the land attack, what is that typically involving? What does that entail? Uh, living off the land cyber attack techniques uh, refers to a sophisticated cyber attack strategy that involves exploiting legitimate uh, system tools, utilities, and the functionalities that are already present within a compromised system or a network. So living off the land um, attacks, they blend in with the normal system, uh, normal system activity, making it significantly harder to detect and remediate. And sometimes they are also referred to as a fileless attack. Now, I like to give you and understand um, this concept of living off the land attack with a certain analogy. And let me explain how I look at living off the land attack. So let's say I'm a detection engineer living in an Austin. I have a house with the facilities. I have a mobile phone, TV to watch my sports. I have a car to drive around. Now, if I have to leave all these luxuries behind and start living off the land or living off the grid, um, I'll have to go back to the traditional ways of living. Maybe start farming to earn my bread, or maybe have cows uh, to, you know, get or some kind of a livestock um, to earn something instead of going to a grocery store and buying stuff. Uh, anyway, you get the point, right? So whenever I need for whatever I need for a living. Uh, can also be achieved using traditional ways. Um, we can call it a built-in ways of living. If I ask you a question, right? How do you do a packet capture analysis in Windows? What comes to your mind? Uh, what tool would you use to do packet capture? Like I would use Wireshark. Mm -hmm. Wireshark, right, right. So now if I have to leave this luxury behind of a Wireshark, and go back to the traditional ways, then the packet capture analysis can also be done using NetSH built-in utility. So Wireshark is going to a grocery store <laughs> versus NetSH is a living off the grid or a traditional ways or a built-in ways um, to do the similar kind of um, activity. So that's how I look at living off the land attacks and that's how I define it. So you're making usage of tools and features and utilities that are already present within the victim's operating system and environment. And absolutely. Um, and, and I think what we're starting to see that migrate into is not just using tools that are already in the environment, but attackers starting to observe behavior and emulate the actual administrator's behavior with those tools. And that's, so that's that transition that we're seeing in the modern era. Previously, it was just the le leveraging the tools. Now it's mimicking the administrators. So if you were to, and let's unpack this a little bit further, but if you were to contrast this, um, this utilization of, um, you know, living off the land techniques and contrast that with some of the traditional uh, intrusion-based threats that we see where they're leveraging malware, um, where they're introducing, you know, typically a piece of software uh, to carry out their operations, a backdoor, some other, you know, piece of malware. 
what are some of the features that are different with living off the land techniques and the approach that an adversary is bringing there versus utilizing malware? So as we were discussing about living off the land attack techniques and how do we kind of define it, they are utilizing the legitimate tools and utilities and functionalities within the compromise system or network to carry out their malicious activity. Their modus operandi is stealth. These attacks blend in with the normal system attack, um, normal system activity, making them difficult to detect using uh, conventional security measures that are in place in your um, environment. So some of the common techniques that are used by these attack attackers are, let's say, for example, abusing native tools like a PowerShell or a command prompt or system utilities that are there and misusing this legitimate software like, uh, for example, remote access tool, for example. Whereas malware best attacks are, they rely on introducing a malicious code that is typically in the form of an executable or a script or any embedded object to infect the system and execute that harmful action that they, they wanna uh, execute, right? In case of living off the land attack, that I say that their modus operandi is stealth, but in case of malware based attack, their modus operandi is introducing an external code and therefore you if you know the behavior of the malware then it can be identified by security controls that are in place for example drive by downloads uh, from a compromised website or exploiting software's vulnerabilities to inject the malware so basically in summary living off the land attacks is subtly exploit legitimate tools for covert malicious activities, whereas malware-based attacks are introducing an ex external malicious code uh, that is more easily recognizable by uh, traditional security controls that are in place. I, I think I, I want to double down on that, that aspect of stealth being that modus operandi. A lot of our clients that I've worked with, for example, they have antivirus, antivirus fires, quarantines the file, and the clients still don't investigate. So there's a lot of threat actors that don't really need to worry about stealth. Even if their malware that lands, pops, gets quarantined, they're able to bring in new malware. They, they switch it up a little bit, they come in, now they're not popping, and they continue to do their thing because they know that the security operations, the detections are not necessarily elevated to behavior. Whereas for the threat actors who are worried about stealth, that means they're attempting to operate in environments that would investigate a popped malware, even if it's quarantined. So they've had to elevate their persistence, their advanced techniques in order to address these, the new wave of detections, the new wave of security operations. And I think taking this um, a step further and applying you know, sort of the attack lifecycle to it, um, historically, where we've seen threat actors leveraging living off the land techniques um, versus, you know, utilizing kind of their own custom malware or open source malware. Are there certain parts of the attack lifecycle where these techniques or the malware seems to be leveraged more so? So lateral movement, escalation of privileges. Um, I mean, some of these techniques, some of these utilities within things like Windows can be leveraged at multiple steps of the adversary's operation. But I'm just curious if there's particular parts where there seems to be more prevalence of these techniques? There is no certain certain aspect of, let's say, for example, MITRE framework that are being exploited uh, heavily by these actors. Um, they rely on um, the wide spectrum of the techniques ranging from initial reconnaissance, whether it's a network reconnaissance or a host-based reconnaissance to the persistence and impact and um, you know, laterally moving towards it. So it, it it ranges across the spectrum of different techniques. There's some areas within that attack lifecycle that really lend itself to living off the land, in particular, the internal reconnaissance. When the threat actor has already made a presence and they are attempting to find out what else is on the network, there's a lot of pre-existing tools to do so. Even basic internal reconnaissance, such as what user account am I now operating as? One of the easiest detections in the world is, who am I? 
how often do administrators actually run who am I? It, it, it may be less prevalent than you would think at first blush, but threat actors often do as soon as they land on a system. Whereas the part of the attack lifecycle of gaining initial access, that may be less prevalent for lifting off the land, especially in terms of web shells. Web shells are almost always going to be some sort of custom code that needs to be deployed into the environment to operate. So internal reconnaissance, uh, bringing in data, exfiltrating data, uh, data staging, all of those elements are typically very common with living off the land techniques. And it should be noted, I mean, you know, that there's certainly, uh, this exists in sort of traditional IT networks, but this is also something we've seen as a technique and approach in critical infrastructure, OT networks. Um, in November last year, we put out a blog around Sandworm doing that, for example, in Ukraine. So this larger approach, I think, can be leveraged in multiple different types of networks. Um, some of the reason why we're talking about this, and I think we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later, um, is obviously what we've seen with Volt Typhoon leveraging that in IT networks um, in kind of recent months in, in the last year. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about the behavior aspect of this, and I want to kind of dive into this a little bit further now that we've discussed uh, living off the land and sort of how it relates or differs from traditional malware based intrusions and operations and get into sort of like where you approach this from a detection standpoint, what you look for, you know, how that differs. And Dan, I think one of the points you made too is in this sort of more newer wave of living off the land techniques that we're seeing adversaries leverage. It's not just the utilities and tools themselves that they're leveraging, but it's looking to emulate behavior that would, um, you know, obviously blend in, which again, to your point, I think if you're leveraging this as a tactic, stealth is maybe a little bit higher premium in kind of your approach to an intrusion. So unpack that a little bit more. So some of that I think depends on the profiling of the adversary. The is this an adversary that's practicing general tactics of a F elevated hygiene so that they're always trying to emulate the administrators, they're just always being careful? Or is this an adversary who knows that they absolutely have to operate this way so that they can make a presence for as long as possible, as effective as possible in the environment? Those nuances, I think, affect the methodology by which you need to try and develop these detections. And what I mean by that is, if they're just trying to do the bare minimum to emulate administrators, then a lot of the baselining, identifying what's normal, uh, can, can be sufficient. Where do your administrators operate from? What IP addresses do they typically connect from? What hours of the day are they typically leveraging? When do they use these tools and when do they not use these tools? Uh, are there check-ins? Is there quality assurance from a second administrator? Having these baselines should help uh, to be able to detect against these lower capacity threat actors much more easily. The higher capacity threat actors, the ones who are focused on trying to emulate the administrators because they know they have to, that's where these baselines may not be sufficient because the, the threat actor may be baselining themselves exactly those same things. And this is where there needs to be a partnership between both detection and security architecture so that the security controls can really enforce and narrow down all of the access paths, the access methodology, even doing application control to really lock down exactly how the administrators must operate. Just-in-time access, just-in-time permissioning, for example, can be particularly strong with interrupting these type of threat actors' activities. So to kind of sum up some of that, you know, baselining is important, but then even when you're dealing with a threat actor where they're doing that kind of themselves to evade detection even more so, that could probably give you some idea of the type of threat actor you're dealing with in terms of the exactly. level of patience and discipline that you're you're experiencing. Exactly. Let me let me give an example, right? So when we define living off the land attacks, we talked about um Wireshark versus NetSH utility, right? Now, apart from packet capture, what else NetSH can do? Uh, let's understand how NetSH utility, a built-in command line utility that is being used by an attacker uh, in living off the land attack techniques. Now, um, this utility is also listed in Lolbins or Lolbas project as one of the many built-in utilities that is exploited by this attacker 
this type of attackers using living off the land attack technique. So, so if you want, let's say for example, first to perform a network reconnaissance. Now you can use a command net sh interface show interface to reveal all the available network adapters. You can also use the commands like net sh adv firewall show all profiles uh, to provide the current firewall configuration revealing open ports and potentially exploit uh, potentially exploitable services. Um, if you want to perform a persistence using a net sh uh, utility, then you can use a commands like net sh add helper and then the path to a malicious DLO that lets attacker register a malicious DLL. This is executed every time net sh is run, providing a persistent backdoor. Now let's focus on this persistent backdoor, right? If how do I create the detection for this? Now we know how these utilities are exploited by an attacker. Then we can create a detection rules for it. So for potential persistent via NetSH, we know that the command that is being used is NetSH add helper and the path to the malicious DLL. To capture this potential persistence, we can use process creation windows logs, detect the execution of NetSH with add helper flags. So very simple detections can be uh, image name that ends with NetSH.exe and the command line argument that contains add and the helper keywords. So this is how we can assess each of the built-in binaries that are being used by living off the land attack attackers and understand how these binaries are used and exploited and then create the detections for it. Now, is this something that you would employ in kind of the early outset of an engagement, an incident response that you're doing where you suspect that a threat actor is using living off the land techniques, or is this something maybe further down the line, you typically have to have some other indicators of attacker behavior, and then you would go search for something like this? I, I think it depends on the suspected threat actor and what intelligence you have, as well as the profile of the victim environment. Uh, say, for example, you know, Department of Energy, extremely rigid, extremely locked down. Uh, that's probably going to be living off the land, just the nature of that environment versus a, a smaller, uh, a smaller organization that doesn't have tight controls, they have very, very loose controls. Maybe everybody's an administrator on their endpoint, right? Living off the land may not even be necessary there. The typical standard exploit process of, you know, sending spam phishing, and we get you to click a link, we've taken your credentials, and now we can just log in as you. It, they don't need any of that. So when, you, when you're thinking about, I guess maybe going back to this topic of um, threat actors that may be employing this technique as a way to evade um, some of the traditional security controls, and also understanding that like there's legitimate uses of a lot of these utilities, like the fact that they're built in and they're being employed, right? Typically, uh, that's the case. How would you go about identifying, um, you know, adversary behavior, suspected adversary behavior that would be abuse of these legitimate tools? A couple of years ago in, a, in an old job of mine, uh, we were tracking volume shadow uh, lever. We were tracking who was using the volume shadow administration tools. And we were attempting to detect whenever the volume shadows were being deleted. If you read the Bolt Typhoon press release from the CISA, then you'll see that this was a heavily abused tool by Volt Typhoon uh, in order to get domain credentials. Well, it's also a commonly used administrative tool in order to manage disk space, particularly on domain controllers. So in order to differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate use of this tool, we had to work with the administrators to understand when they would use it, why they would use it, what kind of communications would they execute when they used it. And for us, it became as simple as, hey, admins, anytime you're going to delete a volume shadow, can you just let us know? And then we know it's you. And the follow-up is fast. The follow-up is easy. And it really minimizes the amount of extra investigation leg legwork. Whereas if we saw a detection for a deletion of a volume shadow, and we had no communications from the administrators, whom we already knew tip are the only ones who do that, 
then we would ramp up that investigation and we'd start to really trigger a incident response. I think this is a very important question in my opinion, right? Uh, differentiating between normal administrative use of a built-in tool and their misuse and living of the land techniques is one of the biggest challenge in defending against these attacks. Um, so how do I approach this, right? First, focus on the behavior and not just the tools that are being used, right? Context is everything. Let's say, for example, the mere presence of a PowerShell or a WMI is not a red flag or having a net SSH in your environment is not a red flag. These are used uh, daily by administrators. So pay we can pay as a detection engineer, we can pay attention to how these tools are being used. For example, location. Is a tool being run from an expected directory or uh, from unusual user folder? The second example could be accounts, right? Is this a regular user launching the typical tool or is that tool typically only reserved for admins or privileged users? Another example could be the command line arguments that are being used. What specific commands and flags that are being used in combination with the tools. For example, PowerShell with an encoded script. For me, I, I immediately, it may be suspicious. So that's how we, you can approach it. That's the first, first one, focusing on the behavior and not just the tool. The second thing that I, uh, how do I approach this is when we think about living off the land, First thing you need to know your land. So what Dan was talking about, understanding normalcy in your env environment, knowing your baselines are key. What Dan was talking about is very important. So for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. When you think about user behavior, profile users' typical daily activities, like login times, the software they use. This allows you to spot outliers, a user, suddenly utilizing a system tools that they never have used before is a warning sign. Uh, one of the example could be remote access from unusual location, a PowerShell based script that is performing a remote session from an admin account that is located in anomalous geographical region um, that should be investigated. Now, in my opinion, this is gonna be a, you know an ongoing cat and mouse game. Because understanding what is quote unquote normal is a baseline, but attackers will change their techniques often. So it is very important and crucial as a detection engineer to stay up to date on current living of the land trends to refine your detections. See, think about how they are uh, updating themselves so I can update my detections as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that. The, there's a quote that I reference often. There is no teacher but the enemy. We are dependent on the adversary to tell us what they are doing, which means as detection engineers, we're highly dependent on threat intelligence to allow us to know where we even need to focus. It is common for a lot of organizations to throw in detections or attempt to make, for example, the MITRE attack matrix as green as possible, and then say they're done. We've done all the detections we need, we're good to go, and they're not actually reflecting and updating based on intelligence. They may find that some of their old detections are not necessary anymore, prone to false positives, where there's new techniques or new permutations of the same techniques that now need to be incorporated. You know, one of the things that uh, Sean referenced was, uh, are these utilities being used from the right directory? One of the things that was reported in the CISA report for Volt Typhoon is comm services DLL was being moved from the normal directory to a different directory or an out of date version of that DLL was being placed in the wrong directory. Uh, those type of things would not normally be keyed on by a detection engineer until he or she sees that threat intelligence and says, oh, okay, this is something I need to pay attention to. Since I'm worried about this threat actor, I need to be worried about this technique. Now, how do I get the signal so I can start detecting it? So we've danced around it a couple of times, and this is largely, you know, kind of the impetus for this episode around living off the land techniques, but Volt Typhoon. Um, this is a, a suspected Chinese APT actor. 
um, one that has used living off the land techniques. And in particular, I think part of the reason why there's a greater degree of, of concern around this threat actor is not just the difficulty in detecting their activity, but the fact that the nature of a lot of their targets are such that they have maybe less espionage value, as we typically see from Chinese APTs, and they are more like the types of critical infrastructure that could potentially be sabotaged or disrupted um, you know, down the road. And so the concern there is that this initial access uh, that these threat actors are seeking is potentially more for that sabotage purpose than it is actual espionage. So I guess a two-parter question. One, what are the particular living off the land techniques that we're seeing Volt Typhoon use specifically, you know, with our understanding today? And then second, you know, Sean, back to your point about things being context dependent, what are some questions you would ask and want to gain uh, an understanding of, let's say, if you're responding to an organization where there's suspected Volt Typhoon intrusion? What are some of the initial thoughts, the initial like areas you would gather data, questions you would ask the organization, administrators, et cetera? Um, so curious your thoughts on both of those. So um, in case of Volt Typhoon, right, um, if I have to detect a Volt Typhoon activity in an environment, um, as a detection engineer, I use specific methodology to create my detections um, when I think about creating a detection. So let me walk you through how I would create the detections for Volt Typhoon with my methodology of creating a detection. So first and foremost thing is threat modeling and gathering as much as threat intelligence about that threat actor. Dan and you uh, both mentioned about a CSA report that are that has been released rela uh, in relation with Volt Typhoon. So that CSA report can be one of the means to gather as much of threat intelligence about that threat actor. Uh, if you talk about, let's say, host artifacts that are being ex exploited by Volt Typhoon, then we can understand how the threat actor uh, is using a built-in tools like, for example, WMI to gather the information about local drivers or NTDS.DIT utility. So the threat actor may try to exfiltrate this NTDS file and the system directory hive to get information about users, user groups, their group membership and password hashes that are present in that file. Now, the system registry hive contains a boot key that can be used to encrypt that information uh, and retrieve those passwords. We also talked about other binaries that are associated with um, LOL bass and LOL bin projects that are being exploited. So let's understand how the world typhoon is exploiting, uh, for example, net SH utility. And uh, how can we develop a detection for it? So World Typhoon is using a technique called port proxy. What is port proxy? So NetSS utility on Windows systems includes a port proxy functionality. Now its legitimate use uh, is for redirecting a network traffic, which is often helpful for debugging or specific network setups, right? Now, the threat actor like Wolf Typhoon can leverage this port proxy to create hidden tunnel through the compromise system, making their activity even harder to detect. Now, how Wolf Typhoon is using port proxy? First, they achieve initial access to the target system uh, by whatever it means, maybe by exploiting vulnerability or stealing credentials. But once they have an initial access, they use NetSH command and they establish a port proxy rule to forward traffic from a local port on a compromised machine to a remote system that they control. So the command that is being used by Volt Typhoon is NetSH interface space port proxy space add v4 to v4 and the listen port is equal to let's say 443 and the connect address is whatever the destination address they, that they want to connect and connection port is 80. Um, now, before even stepping into creating a detection, the second most important step is understanding your logging and monitoring mechanisms that are in place. To be able to detect the activity, you need logs. 
So defender should set up, set the audit policy for Windows security logs to in, include uh, audit process creation and include command line process creation alerts. By default, these settings are not set. So you have to enable these options to, um, once you enable these options, then it will create a event ID 4688 into a window security logs. And these logs can be viewed by detection engineers. So you need to first um, clear off that login and monitoring mechanisms in your environment. And the third step in my methodology is once that log analysis is complete, then you can write the detection. Um, you can write a detection for new port forwarding rules via NetSSH. So you can look at the Windows process creation log, look for an image file name that ends with NetSSH.exe, and then you can um, look for command line argument, argument keywords like interface, add, port proxy, v4 to v4. This is how uh, we can assess other living of the land attack techniques that are used by Wolf Typhoon, uh, for example, WMI or NTDS utilities and create the specific detection tools for um, those uh, uh, exploitations. I'd like to add to that. One of the things that Sean described is defining that you have this detection requirement and then following up and saying, all right, now let's enable the right logging, the right signals to support that detection. It's really common for organizations to do the opposite. They just turn on a bunch of logs and then say, all right, detect all the things you can detect with the available logs without thinking about what their detection requirements absolutely are. And that can also lead to redundancy. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Sysmon, for example. Sysmon gives great visibility into process starts, process command line arguments. If I have Sysmon and I have that right signal available, maybe I don't need to enable the command line auditing in the normal 4688 events. Vice versa, if my detection requirements are really limited to just process starts and I don't need the, the extra level of signaling that is available through Sysmon, then maybe I don't need to introduce the complexity of yet another agent, right? Administrators hate more and more agents uh, because I've defined my detection requirements and I found that the existing Windows auditing with the process command line enabled is sufficient. So I always try to teach, let the detection requirements drive the logging, and then you can validate that you have just enough logging you need to, to make that work. And is that something that, you know, obviously having the logging in place beforehand makes coming in and doing response work easier. Um, but also I think to your point, you want to avoid drowning in alerts or drowning in too much data or drowning in the wrong sorts of data. So how do you guess you approach this proactively again with a, you know, a view in mind of detecting this particular threat actor, you know, is there certain types of data beyond what have been mentioned here, uh, certain parts of collection, certain areas for collection that you would prioritize more than others? So generally prioritize endpoint logs. Uh, there's active discussions right now as to where the best location for the endpoint logs should be. Is EDR sufficient for endpoint visibility or do we really need redundancy between EDR and SIM to have endpoint logs? But a lot of these operations are drilling into the endpoint and there may be ways to balance between the two. Maybe not all user endpoints need to have verbose logging sent to the SIM, only the servers and your administrators and your VIPs, you know, setting those critical assets, jump boxes if you're leveraging jump boxes, that type of thing. Because there's always gonna be a constraint on resources. There's only so much money available to send to your SIM provider for ingest licensing. We get that, so you wanna prioritize. Uh, I'm also gonna prioritize anything that demonstrates access to sensitive data. Another area that clients often struggle with is their own custom applications and whether or not they've done threat modeling to identify who has accessed sensitive data. What have they done with that sensitive data? Was, was any of that data changed? And if this is a custom application or even a commercial off-the-shelf application, the, the application may not provide that information, that insight in the logs. At best, you may just see Apache logs or IIS logs or the fact that somebody authenticated, not what they did 
after authentication. So thinking, so thinking about those layer seven, if you, we think about the OSI model, the layer seven interactions, which are typically not captured by endpoint logs, not captured even necessarily by cloud logging through cloud-based applications. Often custom, uh, custom logging is necessary to provide that forensic and incident response and detection insight to know where the adversary is pivoting to. Adding on to that, I, I want to say that, um, let's say if you are thinking about an EDR tool, so there are certain rules that you can write inside of that EDR tool, and you can output the output of that rule to a sim solution. Uh, create a JSON uh, lock for that rule, and then uh, input that into your um, sim solution. This is what we have done in one of our uh, previous projects. And uh, another thing that we did for network traffic logs, basically, let's say, for example, if you have a Palo Alto or Cisco, it's you have trillions and trillions of network traffic logs that are being generated constantly in your environment. So you can write your own rules and output of that rule can be ingested to um, the SIM solutions to do that further analysis, what Dan was talking about, create your own custom logs to uh, go to the some solutions. So wrapping this all up, you know, we've talked about this as, a, as an overall general trend that we're seeing, particularly amongst some threat actors of concern like Volt Typhoon. As I mentioned, this isn't just something that we see with respect to IT networks. We didn't even really delve into the OT side, but that obviously exists, you know, in that space as well. What are some kind of final thoughts and takeaways you would leave the audience with I mean, I think a big piece and certainly something I think you hear uh, in a lot of our you know, blogs and other research is the importance of logging. Um, that is something that certainly makes your jobs a lot easier when you're going in responding to an incident. But any other sort of final thoughts and takeaways uh, for organizations concerned about this threat actor or similar groups using similar techniques? We talked about a bunch about um, living off the land techniques and specifically Volt Typhoon as well. So what are some of the key takeaways that I think about what I can do today? I can say like first, remote access tool, right? Understand how the remote access tools are being used in your environment. Uh, taking care of, let's say for example, least privileged mechanisms to access these RATS tools can minimize most of the attacks that can happen in your environment. Um, second key takeaways is to tackle living off the land, like like I, I said before, first, you need to know your land. This may be creating an inventory of a built-in utilities that are used in your environment. Have an understanding about these utilities that are there and create your baselines. How are these utilities being used in your day-to-day -day operations by let's say, for example, admin users or um, any other uh, PowerShell scripts that are using these utilities. Um, so creating that baseline in your environment is critical. Um, third thing is knowing your land in further detail. So like think a little bit deeply, like check if your scripting tools should access the internet. It, should your command.exe or PowerShell.exe should have an access to an internet. There are Microsoft applications that are present in on, on the endpoints. Are they allowed to run macros? Many times, if the macros are enabled, attacker can execute, um, have an executable programs that are run through these mac macros and gets uh, executed. So having an understanding, like a deeper understanding about your environment helps. Fourth th thing that I uh, would suggest is we can go through the list of binaries that are been exploited under this living of the land attack techniques and perform the assessment of these built-in utilities to get more intel about how threat, act threat actor are leveraging these built-in tools to evade the detections. Once you understand how the threat, uh, a threat, once you have a threat intel about that threat actor, how these are evading the detections, then you can write the detections for it. And finally, I would say that we can then follow the detection rule creation methodology from threat modeling and gathering threat intelligence. Second step is 
understanding you know, logging and third step is third step is creating a detection follow that methodology uh, to create your detection tools so i think sean hit pretty much all of my recommendations uh, the one area i would add to that is Volt Typhoon in particular focused on living off the land techniques in order to do that internal discovery, identifying what is normal in the victim's environment so they could operate in that same, uh, same fashion. I'd recommend uh, working with your red team, your pen testing team to identify how would they do internal reconnaissance with the available binaries in the environment, with the available living off the land capabilities. And then from there, you can build out a base of recommendations, which of these binaries can be application controlled, which of these may be available to be renewed, which of these are not actually used by our administrators so we can baseline and say alert anytime NetSH, for example, is being used. Uh, so work with the pen testing team in order to flesh out how your land can be abused against you and then one of the things that Mandiant loves to talk about is the defender's advantage. It's your land. It's your environment. You can change it. Just had a ding from the phone. I'll say that again. There it is. Okay. So one of the things that Mandiant loves to talk about is the defender's advantage. It's your land. It's your environment. So you can manipulate it. You can change it. You can control it in order to make it even more difficult for the adversary to operate. That requires being proactive. So taking advantage of, sadly, other people's misfortunes that turn into threat reports. And then we can really push fixing our environments or coordinating our environments to posture against these threat actor activities. Fantastic. Well, we'll end it right there. Reference to Defender's Advantage. Uh, great point there. Um, Dan, Sean, thank you for sharing your insights. And I think this will be very beneficial to organizations as they approach, you know, building detections for this type of activity um, or responding to this threat actor. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Luke, so much. Thank you so much.